Hello and welcome back to the Undercut Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jesse Billington, and I'm joined as always by the hydraulics failure to my Ferrari, Ellie Mae Taylor. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Better than Charles Leclerc's Ferrari or Carlos Sainz's clutch? Just, yeah, better than anyone in Ferrari at the moment, or feeling better maybe. Mm. Everyone's just in pain a bit. Rough weekend, especially because obviously their customer team, Alfa Romeo, suffered a few engine problems as well. So it's uh, uh, not good. Yeah. Anyway, Hi. I'm doing all right. Busy weekend. I was uh, another weekend working alongside podcasting. So I was uh, down in London and Brighton covering the London Brighton Veteran Car Run. So all cars 1904 and before. Um, tackling the 60 miles from the capital to the coast in a, essentially the recreation of the emancipation run from way back when um and i met ross braun interestingly enough so i'm now two-thirds of the way through meeting the the big figures from braun gp i just need to meet a rubens barrichello and I've, I've ticked that box so um yeah he's quite a nice fellow he was driving a 1903 wilson pitcher which was quite interesting. Um, really unique engineering to it. Quite a nice chap to bump into and talk about it. Um, I met Damon Hill again at the weekend. Just sort of bumped into him literally in London. He was passing through the event and um, interviewed him off the cuff. Um, so yeah, just another standard weekend being me, really. Um, just sort of finding my way into weird locations and situations. But still, all good fun. But uh, shifting from cars that can barely do 40 miles an hour to... Well, in the case of the Ferrari car, that can barely do 40 miles an hour at the best of times. Um, the Brazilian Grand Prix, and we'll kick off with what the hell has happened and uh, take a look at a quick bit of news. And of course, we mentioned in the preview to the Brazilian Grand Prix that the Macau GP is back. And uh, Bianca Bustamante, the McLaren junior driver, also part of F1 Academy, has signed with Black Arts Racing for the Formula 4 round uh, that's taking place at the Macau Grand Prix. I think this forms part of the, an unofficial leg of the Chinese F4 sort of season. She'll be taking part in Macau in the F4 class. And equally, there's some more news coming out of the F3 um, class where Marcus Armstrong has sort of wound the clock back to when he was in Formula 3 to make a return for the event, which is uh, going to be quite interesting. It's a fairly packed roster of interesting drivers from all over the shop going into that F3 league. So it'll be a good race to watch with some uh, some good talent. Mark is, of course, coming from IndyCar, where he's had a pretty decent season. I think Rookie of the Year this year, I believe. Uh, in other news, Formula 1, and obviously getting a bit closer to Brazil, um, Formula 1 will race in Brazil for a further five years on top of its existing contract. It's now been extended to 2023 three inclusive no 2030 rather inclusive um do you think this is the right move i do because it creates very good and sometimes maybe a little bit bonkers racing or something out of the ordinary seems to mainly happen at brazil and also what i thought was really nice to see and i kind of wanted to know was how great the fans were Every driver got a huge cheer. There was no booing. From what I've seen, no fighting. It's a shame that that isn't the norm and really that's what we should be expecting from every race. But the atmosphere just looked great. The atmosphere did look crackers. I mean, inside the circuit, it was crackers and great and positive. Outside of the track, it's a little bit of a different story. Drivers being shuttled around in cars with bulletproof glass, team personnel being told to wear nondescript and plain clothing over team kit wear on their way to the circuit. It's a, yeah, it's swings and roundabouts with Brazil. I think it has a few issues as soon as you step outside of the circuit, but once you're inside, it is, um, it seems to bring together fans that genuinely appreciate and enjoy the sport for its sort of tumultuous events that always seem to unfold at Sao Paulo. So it's, yeah, I think at the end of the day, it is a good thing and it's a good circuit to keep on the calendar for the sport's benefit, if anything. It's, even in a season where everything has been quite dull and quite predictable to a certain extent, Brazil has still thrown up some uh, interesting moments, to say the least. So I think it's nice to have it stick around. Yeah. To be fair, I didn't know that that was going on outside of it. Yeah, a little bit of uh, picking around and uh, sort of following a few sort of threads and stories on social media. Again, whether or not these are completely true or not is here or there. But yeah, I think um, personal security measures in um, 
Brazil are taken differently to say when we're in Spain or Italy or America. So it's um yeah. As a race weekend, it poses its own unique set of challenges, even if that is Ted Kravitz interviewing a watermelon at one point. Um, but yeah, Brazil is sticking around until 2030. But speaking of another F1 circuit, or certainly a circuit that F1 races on, Bahrain and the World Endurance Series will take a bit of a swerve away from single-seaters to closed cockpit endurance racing. And, well, the rain falls heavily on the plains in Bahrain. The final round of the 2023 World Endurance um, Series concluded after wet running in Bahrain's practice session through schedules and run plans for a loop in FP1 was a bit strange seeing a circuit we've only ever known as dry suffering from what looked like torrential rain especially as Bahrain isn't that far away from Abu Dhabi is it not particularly I think it's a bit further up the coast but it's it's sort of within a few hours by car certainly yeah, and you never ever see when we go to Abu Dhabi that it's. Have we ever had wet conditions? Well, even in around Abu Dhabi, because obviously they're around the same time of year. Mm, very good question. You always just associate it with the desert, but obviously they, Hot they and have. Dry, like, yeah. yeah, but it does, it has to rain. Yeah. Um, I don't Wet know. always brings rain anyway. Yeah, WEC loves a wet race. But anyway, uh, one thing they did have at this weekend's WEC um, adventures was their rookie driver test too, with some familiar names popping up, including Robert Schwartzman for Ferrari and Valentino Rossi for WRT in the LMP2 seats, which was quite interesting. There's a couple of other familiar faces if you really know sort of your backwaters of motorsport. But Schwartzman obviously is Ferrari's F1 test and reserve driver. And they're also giving him a, a quick run out in the 499P as well. So uh it's good to see he's at least getting a taste of different things. He's not, he's not being left bored set at Maranello. But the Valentino Rossi one is quite interesting because famously he did test as a replacement for Michael Schumacher at Ferrari at one point in time. was, by all accounts, quite good. Um, but equally, he's done a season now in an Audi R8 in the sort of tour, World Touring Series. And yeah, it looks like he's found um, another possible in although of course lmp2 won't be around next year apart from at le mans uh, which we'll get into but of course this is the final round of the season so we had the three leagues of the world endurance series um sort of concluded with um most notably the iron dames making history as the first all-female team to win an fia world endurance championship round in the final season of the lmgte amateur class they also took pole in their class two um Michelle Gatting, along with Sarah Bovey and Rachel Fe- Rahel Fay, brought to end and brought to brought the car along to the end and secured Iron Dames P two in class, and a brilliant season long f- ending a brilliant season long fight with Corvette Racing just clinching the title. So, I don't know if you've been following much of the World Endurance Championship. Um, I try and follow it as and when I can. Obviously, it's endurance, so it's not a case of just sitting at. In front of the TV for an hour, it's <laughs> a lot more than that. Um, but yeah, I think it's a shame that LMGT is being replaced by GT3s. Um, it's not as difficult a car, I don't believe, as well. You know, maybe the Iron Dames could have carried on that momentum and I don't know, maybe gone for a championship next year, but uh, well, tried to go for the championship next year, but. I think Corvette Racing have been pretty dominant this year. I don't know how many they've won, but they've won the majority of them, I think. Uh, let's have a check. Just got too far. Uh, Corvette Racing, one at Sebring, one in Portimao, second place at Spa, one at Le Mans, fourth in Monza, second at Fuji, seventh in Bahrain. So, yeah, they've had um, more wins than any other team in the series. But, yeah, Iron Dames with... 8th, 3rd, 5th, 4th, 5th, 4th, 1st. So pretty good consistency and a decent sort of chunk of points ahead of AF Corsa as well, which is the um, sort of strong link, strongly linked to Ferrari sort of um, GT team. So they've done well in that regard. It's an all-round good showing from Iron Dames and really proves that there is 
room and quality when it comes to female drivers in motorsport and we should definitely see more of it hope and hopefully will do in the future with it shifting to gt3 i can see them hopefully sticking around to enjoy the gt3 class we've seen a few cars being put together for it the new mustang dark horse from ford that is basically set to run in the gt3 class it's forming up as we go along but it's it's great to see this sort of this piece of history being made and a new light being shone on it and a new sort of set of role models being put in front of a young and excited audience. So it's, 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 it's good news at the end of the day, really. Equally, WRT secured the LMP2 title with Robert Kubica, Ray Andrade and Louis Delatraz. Uh, a win here rounding out their championship on the ultimate high and bringing an end to the LMP2 class. Next year, it's Hypercars or LMGT3 um, throughout the season with, as we already mentioned, the exception of LMP2's racing at Le Mans. There are a lot of privateers that enjoy bringing out the older Rakers and Gibsons and giving it a shot. Um, at the top of the table, though, after a race that started in chaos, we saw the Ferraris collide at one point, but none of this, however, threatened the number eight Toyota, which was racing to defend its 2022 title and did so with confidence. Sebastian Buemi, uh, Brendan Hartley and Ryo Hirakawa have come out on top with Toyota besting Ferrari. Toyota, interestingly, is the only mark, only failed to win one round this season, Le Mans, which famously was won by Antonio Giovinazzi in the Ferrari, with uh, either of its cars taking victory throughout the year. So it's, yeah, pretty dominant season by Toyota. And again, this is something they've been building on for quite a while. I think since Porsche and Audi dropped out of the LMP1s, Toyota just sort of kept their finger on the button, especially with the shift towards hypercar. They've just proven to be sort of dominant and it's it's impressive really yeah if it wasn't for the number eight toyota winning then it was the number seven um although number seven actually had more wins this year but their ninth in portimao and their retirement at le mans really hurt them which meant that the number eight got it instead coincidentally they were the two races that i watched the most portimao i watched it in its entirety and le mans apart from sleep i pretty much watched that too but so it's kind of one of those things where I've somehow cursed a car again. Um, mm. But it was great to see Ferrari win at Le Mans. Yeah, it was nice to see that Ferrari Le Mans win. But yeah, like you said, four wins for that second Toyota car win in Sebring, Spa, Monza and Fuji. Uh, but yeah, like the the ninth in Portimao and the retirement at Le Mans really wasn't what uh, Conway, Kobayashi and Lopez needed to sort of secure that one. So somehow consistency coming to the fore for the number seven car. And uh, yeah, four second places, two wins and a sixth in Monza was all they really needed. And it was a good little gap they actually had over um, the second car. But even then, that's it was too much for any other team to really try and chase down. Yeah. And isn't um I mean it's kind of a shame to see um LMP2 go as well, but I think it's because the hyperclass would be too big, isn't it, to have both L um hypercar and LMP2 in the championship together. And that's sort of why now we've only got the two mm. cities going side by side. Yes, yeah, going into next year when you the um Teams and entrants haven't been confirmed, but obviously we've got the likes of Alpine and Lamborghini joining the hypercar class. So that's going to be swelled by at least another two cars, another six drivers at the bare minimum. It depends how many cars they want to put forward. But um, yeah, it's essentially it's becoming a, a larger grid made up of two different classes. I don't think there's really scope apart from Le Mans, which has the benefit of being a huge racing circuit. You can sort of have those extra cars running and it's sort of because it's such a spread out field by that point it works a bit better but the 2024 calendar looks interesting and we're heading back to into Lagos I think it was first last visited by WEC in 2014 which will be quite interesting um, and equally we've got the Lone Star Le Mans we had to circuit with Americas as well which should be quite good and then if you if you look at those circuits you then realise why they can now only have sort of two classes but I believe, or it's rumoured, that Ferrari may bring a third team as well. So, If they do, that will be phenomenal. And I'm curious as to who's driving it. I wouldn't be surprised if having, especially off the back of this rookie test, we do see Schwarzman in that seat. 
anyhow. WEC sort of draws to a close, but we've still got some F1 to talk about. We'll kick off with qualifying, which was red flagged in the final phase for climatic changes. A conventional and dry qualifying on Friday afternoon um, took place. Come Q3, though, Perez failed to get a fast enough banker lap in before the rain came and so lost out qualifying ninth. At the top, though, the Aston Martin plan of going hard early paid off with Stroll P3 and Alonso behind him in P4. This is Stroll's highest starting position since Turkey 2020, where he started on pole, quite famously. A huge change in weather in the latter part of Q3 saw the session abandoned as roofs were blown off grandstands and rain began to pour. Russell, Ocon and Gasly were then handed two place grid penalties apiece for impeding in the pit lane. The race directors ahead of this had issued a note to drivers to stick to the left on pit exit, so drivers who don't want to queue can simply blast through. Is this the right solution to the problem they caused by trying to eliminate the traffic paradise with those minimum lap times or maximum lap times rather? Um, I think firstly, quickly, just going back to qualifying itself, I think it was incredibly tight in Q1 with just half a second between Max in first and Daniel Ricciardo in 17th. So there really is no margin for error as the pack gets closer to each other sort of development wise. And then sort of in Q3, it was the case of a driver who went out early, benefited the most as conditions worsened really quickly as qualifying went on. So I think that's why we sort of ended up with that slightly jumbled up grid order. Um, but going back to your question in terms of uh, drivers being allowed to go slowly, as long as they stick to the left-hand side to allow those who want to go get out quicker to go through. I think Abu Dhabi has a long pit exit, so there may be enough room there. I don't know how long the pit exit's going to be for Las Vegas, and I don't know how well this will work for pit exits that are shorter. But I guess for now, in the interim, it it, it works whilst they come up with perhaps a better solution for this next year. And I think drivers would definitely also listen to this as they were quick to give Russell Gowsley and Ocon penalties for not complying. And we saw in the shootout that no one impeded anyone. So drivers are listening to this. Mm. Drivers are definitely listening to it and paying attention. I, whether it's whether it's a situation that's applicable to every circuit is going to be different. I think they might get away with doing the same thing in Las Vegas. I've got the map up in front of me. Um, pit entry is just before turn 17, Top Golf. I don't know if that's the name. It's literally opposite Top Golf golfing driving range um and then you sort of swing into the left essentially onto the infield for the pits because it's an anti-clockwise circuit come obviously through the pits and then you go past harbour island apartments at turn one and it feeds you out into sort of the tightening section of which we of turn one which is turn two just before the rochelle avenue intersection of turn three and four so it's yeah interesting how they're gonna i'm assuming they've built a fairly wide pit and pit exit for Las Vegas because you would if you're building a new circuit simply make it a bit bigger where you know you need the space Ooh, I, mm, we'll have to wait and see how it's applied there but yeah the, we're seeing that happen through the tunnel that goes under the circuit in Abu Dhabi will be a very interesting one indeed sprint shootout is it was a lot more conventional, actually, qualifying for that. Norris would qualify on pole in the sprint shootout after Esteban Ocon and Fernando Alonso came together in SQ1 and wiped one another out. Ocon had a wobble coming through turns one and two, but was way offline. And once he'd collected his car, it meant he clattered into a rather meandering Fernando Alonso. Who do we think was at fault here? Alonso was on a slow lap in the middle of nowhere. Meanwhile, Ocon had just ballsed up the opening turns, but kept pushing. Or was this just a racing incident? I think it was just an incident. Um, Alonso could have obviously been more to the right, but I think I'm not sure whether we would have it would have prevented him and Ocon from colliding as Ocon lost the car. I think it's just one of those things. Mm, wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. Tough luck. If you even if been a bit further over, he would, Ocon might just simply have hit a different part of him. I think he was still sort of trying to get the car back on track but sort of responding conventionally to his inputs I think would be the, the polite way of putting it yeah but uh, 
it spiced things up a little bit. But uh, beyond that, it was relatively straightforward with Yuki Snowda again out qualifying Daniel Ricciardo. The real question here is why do we keep underestimating Yuki? I know personally, I came into the season expecting De Vries to wipe the floor with him, but it didn't happen. Um, Lawson was one for four against Sonoda. Um, De Vries managed to get two in, uh, but it was 10 to Sonoda. And uh, of the seven occasions we've had Sonoda go against Ricardo in qualifying, including sprints, um, it's currently 4 3. So he's just got the upper hand as little Yuki. There's a really good driver in there. We've put him against some relatively highly ranked drivers now as well. I think we should give him more credit than he's perhaps given, but I think he's a good driver, but I don't think he's a great driver. I think part of it is because he still makes kind of rookie mistakes. He can struggle with bat- he can struggle to battle with other drivers at some um at times. And He's been there for three years now, and whilst he has matured, I'm not sure he's matured enough or maturing quick enough in his driving. I think that's perhaps why we underestimate him a bit. Mm. I think there's there's definitely some rough edges that we should have expected to be gone by this point. Certainly when you look back on that crash with Piastri in Mexico, that's almost like a sort of a key example to it, but there is a very talented Helmersmith within him. And we do see that certainly in qualifying where he does seem to have the upper hand of being able to get that one lap pace out of his car. That's not to besmirch Daniel Ricciardo's pace. Uh, we'll move into the sprint where I've just realised I've forgotten completely to write any notes, but it was quite uneventful for the large part off the top of my head. Well, you had both both the Avatari's battling with various cars and at the end you had um yuki getting one of the mercedes as well got yes true he did get past lewis yeah so i think um congratulations really to yuki for coming just over the entire weekend just one point shy of scoring the same amount of points as seven-time world champion lewis hamilton but yeah it was it was a decent sprint but ultimately verstappen had norris pretty early on and by that point it was relatively at least in the front half of the grid a foregone conclusion Perez had had a decent get away, get away from the line and Bob's your uncle I see for me I, I actually enjoyed the sprint I thought a fair amount was going on um obviously there are talks that F1 may change the format of sprint weekends next year and I have to say I think I said it a while back um but I think they should just do a reverse grid order for the sprint we have you know the one, maybe the one qualifying session uh, that covers both the race and the sprint, we take maybe the top 10 or top 15 and just reverse it. Teams are still going to obviously then want to be the quickest in qualifying because they'll want to be as close to the front as possible for the race. Um, and the teams are so close now as well in terms of development that I don't think it'll be easy uh, for whoever gets polled to then blast through the pack, maybe barring Mac. Mm. Um, as they'll be the as they'll be last in the sprint, I think that's the way you sort of spice things up. Even if it doesn't lead to maybe exciting, even exciting racing, it might lead to a bit more excitement in terms of points mm. and the championship that way. There are definitely ways of improving the sprint. In the back of my mind, I quite like the idea of a reverse championship order, forming the grid for the sprint. Keep the weekend structure the same as it is. Um, but allow there to be some chance for teams to adjust setups post the sprint because that is the one thing we're seeing is teams have got one hour of practice and then cars are locked in for sort of setup after that point they sort of very much enter park Ferme pretty quickly as soon as qualifying for the grand prix finishes so there's not a lot of time for teams to get the cars put together which i think why we see sprint weekends is quite exciting is because teams are sort of cobbling together a setup pretty hurriedly in a weekend i assume there's a lot of work that goes on in factories credit to the people that do that but that doesn't always play out in the way that you expect it to on the field so you do have to make those adjustments on the fly and yeah looking back at where everyone started for the sprint there was a few sort of big movers bottas dropped back a fair amount of ways so did hulkenberg but yeah it was it, it, i don't think it's going to stick out to me as one of the most exciting sprints see for me i thought it was one of the more exciting 
Well, there we go. Split opinion. Let us know in the comments which way you'd rather have it. Um, We'll move, though, on to the main event from the weekend, which was, of course, the race. And on the formation lap, Charles suffered what presented as a hydraulic failure. I think it was an error in a sensor reportedly shut off the hydraulic system to the engine, which essentially locked the back axle, sent him round into the wall. Um, a quick restart, though, saw him sort of trundle it off into a, a sort of off-track area and retire the car. So an unfortunate start there. However, once the five lights went out, Hulkenberg collected... In the process, I will add, of being sandwiched by his teammate, um, Albon, sending Albon across the two has across one has into the second of Magnussen. Um, Albon and Magnussen then wipe out massively, red flagging the race after coming into uh, coming together in turn one of lap one. The loose tire from Albon's car was sort of careened out onto the circuit. If you watch carefully, you see that Nico Hulkenberg actually runs over it, jettisoning it into the air, and where it lands on the rear wing of Daniel Ricciardo's Alpha Tauri. Equally, while spinning, Magnussen smacks into the back of Oscar Piastri's McLaren, damaging his diffuser and rear wing. Both Australians then dive into the pits instead of being collected by the safety car for a lap, and so rejoin the race a lap down when the action restarts. So essentially, the McLaren and Alpha Tauri pitted their cars there too early for all the red flag was flown too late. However, should the race have gone back a lap to even out this issue, or should they have let DR3 and OP81 do a second lap to the grid, the same as you'd do for a safety car restart where you let the lapped cars unlap themselves? Um, I think like the safety car restart, they should have been allowed to up unlap themselves because then they would have used sort of a similar amount of fuel then to get round. So then it they become sort of a bit more equal in that way. But ultimately as well, I think both pitted due to damage on their cars so I think it was better for them to pit than do another lap around the circuit with the safety car in the hope of perhaps they're red flagging it and then maybe leaving potential further debris around the track. I think it's you can't really punish them for doing the right thing. I know they were going to retire the car, mm. especially in McLaren's case. So they kind of lucked out that there was a red flag and that they could sort that out. But... I think they should have let them unlap themselves like a safety car restart. It's It was slightly different circumstances. When I went to the London E-Pre this year, I can't remember who it was now, but there was essentially a pile-up that meant that the top three had done an extra lap to everyone else and then the race was red flagged. And once racing could resume, everyone bar the top three did an extra lap so that they were then on the same lap as the top three come the restart. I think it should have been the case still here. Because mm, there was two point, interesting points that were raised and Daniel Ricciardo raised one of them and he said if more cars were in his and Oscar's scenario, would they have let a huge amount of cars start the entire race a lap down? Surely not. And equally, it's worth remembering that Daniel Ricciardo's pace in clean air, which he was sort of running in for most of the race, was close to matching Verstappen's all race long. So I think Danny Rick lost out a hell of a lot here. And it's I'm not the biggest Danny Rick advocate, but arguably you should have fair racing. And I think when this has happened, there are, and there are easy ways of making it fair under those scenarios probably should have been done especially when you've red flagged the race you stopped it you've got that time to sort of reconvene and reorganize things there's no reason that that probably shouldn't have been enacted i was trying to look at the sort of how close ricardo and piastri were closing the gap and the problem was is i couldn't work out whether i think it ended up being hulkenberg in last whether hmm. he was slowing or they were catching I think it was Hulkenberg was slowing down, but I think at some point they were kind of ended up almost being a minute behind. So they were still a lap, almost a lap behind come the end of the race. So it's, you can't make that up mm. during a race. So it then gets to the point of, well, what's the point of racing? Finding, yeah. Yeah. If you've been lapped on track, fair enough, but you could still be having a battle with someone else for position. But in reality, it was just, Danny Rick and Oscar hoping they might catch up with the rest of the field or hoping there'd be some sort of safety car where they get to unlap themselves but that never came I think there was a there was a gamble there that they were waiting to happen unfortunately it didn't if they'd had a conventional safety car or a period of yellows they would have been given the opportunity to unlap themselves but it didn't come so they were never able to unfortunately 
off the initial start, we saw the Aston struggle to get off the line and got eaten up by Hamilton and Norris, both chasing down Verstappen, who, courtesy of Charles' early retirement on the formation lap, already had a car's length over the field. At the race restart, Verstappen got away again well, with Norris challenging him through the opening phase. Off the line, Norris's launch is very potent, but essentially once rolling and into second gear, the Red Bull just picks up pace unlike any other car, making it quite hard to catch. That second phase of acceleration, once it's moving, phenomenal. The Red Bull is quite fragile on its clutch and really struggles to get initial rolling, but as soon as it's going, it disappears. And we see this a lot with safety car restarts. This is why Verstappen is just able to get the hell out of Dodge because as soon as the car is rolling and has the slightest bit of traction, it's not dealing with a breakaway force, boom, it's gone. It's so happy and ready to deploy that power. It's unstoppable, really. Yeah, you you saw it both time, both um, the sprint and the race, really, that even Norris didn't even really get a bad a start the first time round. Um, I think his reaction time was perhaps quicker than uh, the Stappen's, but it just the Red Bull just accelerated it. Like Norris couldn't have done anything really. That Red Bull was just quick to once, like you said, once it gets going, it's just, it gets to naught to however many miles per hour. It gets you incredibly quickly and just quicker than the others. Yeah. The it's zero to 60 kilometers an hour. I think the McLaren has the Red Bull, but everything from 60 kilometers an hour to about 140 kilometers an hour all of the Red Bull, it just eats it up all of a sudden. And that initial phase, the Red Bull struggles. But in the second phase, as soon as it's up and gone, it is gone. If you watch Lando's onboard, you do see him sort of almost get closer to Verstappen. But then you perhaps hear them sort of shift through second, maybe into third, or probably second given the distances. And the Red Bull just starts to pull away again. You're like, oh, there we go. <laughs> Race result determined. Thank you very much. Well- would it be in the car that would mean that it accelerates better? Essentially, it's it's going to be the way that the car is able to deploy its torque low down. And I don't know at what point the electric motor kicks in to help the car get off the line. It really depends on, at that point, a huge amount of your start depends on traction. If you look at drag racing cars, they have do the burnout before they start and they have huge sticky slicks that help launch the cars off the line. F1 cars have a similar extent, but they arguably have more power than they do traction when sitting stationary. That's where things like the McMurtry Spearling come in because they generate two times their own weight before they're even moving because of that sort of under effect fan. That's why the Spearling gets off the ground quickly because its tyres have all the grip in the world and more grip than they have power. The F1 cars is the wrong way around. You essentially have more power than grip and the problems to go from there. It, I think it's something about the fact that the Red Bull just sort of perhaps eases away a bit more. It's one of the most powerful sort of power units on the grid. It just eases itself in a bit more because arguably that's better than just slipping them, spinning the tyres because then you start cooking them and blister the top surface. So potentially it's just the way they have to drive the Red Bull is just baby it through first gear, bang it into second, and then go. Because that way you're less likely to suffer the wheel spin. And I think that is possibly the way it's done. Whereas with the McLaren, it's a slightly more balanced package between its grip and its power. So it can simply just sort of dump the clutch in first, not really have to worry too much about wheel spin. And it gets gone quickly, but then just cannot compete with the power of the Red Bull in the second phase of acceleration. Equally, it depends on power delivery from the petrol engine, the electric setups. And yeah, all manner of things. It's it's hugely complicated because there's so many different factors at play from where you get your power from and also where you get your grip from. I think how soon the rear diffuser on the car starts to actuate and work. If the Red Bull has a diffuser that starts working at a lower speed, it's immediately generating a lot more grip and it can just put the power down without having to worry. So it's there's a lot of different things about it. It's a really interesting science to focus on simply the race from that sort of first zero to perhaps 160 kilometers an hour. So many things happen. And that's why you see drivers doing their practice starts. They do their burnouts on the way to the grid is to try and perfect that first eight seconds of a Grand Prix. Because as we've seen in the past two race weekends, that is where a race is won or you come second or possibly even lose it. The Red Bull struggled uh, off the start a bit. Was it last year or the year before? Last so maybe- year and the year before, certainly the year prior, um, at Abu Dhabi, 
the one thing that sort of gave every Hamilton fan hope was the fact that off the line, the Red Bull is not the quickest thing in that first bit. And that's where Hamilton had the advantage in Abu Dhabi. But then immediately, if it's a rolling start, the Red Bull is just so quick because it's got that immediate traction. It can just sort of roll through the power a bit better. It just had, I think, 2021, it had a quite a fragile clutch. Last year, possibly the same issue. This year, they've seemed to have figured it out. They've gone the opposite way to Ferrari and found a very sort of reliable clutch system that works and allows them to feed the power out properly. I was going to say that's perhaps maybe why Red Bull have been that much better at it this year. They've probably had a team focus on it because they knew that that was their Achilles heel. Yeah, because equally it is a, it's a hand clutch you use for first. So you simply sort of hold the car against it. You feel a biting point through the lever. You feel the engine dip as it takes the load. And then you sort of, the same way you would driving a car where you use two feet to do it, you sort of release the clutch pedal or paddle on the back of the wheel and obviously then start flicking up through the gears. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing and could probably sort of go on about it for several hours and we could get mechanics and engineers in to talk about it, but that would get quite dull. Anyway, um, after the restart, obviously, Verstappen gets away well. And from there, a relatively dull race unfolded with a two-stop strategy coming out as the most popular option. There were drivers that were looking to work on either a one-stop or I think Ocon went for a three-stop as well, which wasn't particularly favourable, but still earned him a point. So not the worst. Yeah, did work in the end. Um the one crucial thing, though, was the undercut became quite a powerful tool if you could utilise a good outlap. If you came out and got a good run down the pit straight and were released into clear air, it really was a very powerful tool. And we saw it shuffle up the order quite a few times with drivers either pitting too early or not pitting early enough against a rival for track position. Alonso had a strong race early on. He was battling Hamilton for position. But as the Mercedes faded through the race, um, his progress really became one against Sergio Perez, whose form looks to have reset this weekend after a dire Mexico. On the offence, he's still not the sharpest. But in defence, we're seeing the golden touches we've seen from him before. And I think this was a Sergio Perez we've been longing to see since perhaps Saudi or Australia, really. Yeah, it's you almost wanted to tell him to take... I mean, I I didn't really want him to overtake Fernando Alonso, but if I was being partial here, um, you almost wanted to tell Perez to take the line that Alonso's taking out of the final corner so that he had a fighting chance against Alonso. It was... He wasn't doing anything different to get near Alonso for the majority of the time that he was behind Alonso. And, you know, you usually see drivers, when you've been behind someone for that long, they usually want to try something different. And you didn't really see that from Perez. Maybe it's a confidence thing. Mm. I don't know. Maybe he needs a bit more trust in the car to sort of experiment. But, yeah, that was sort of... It was a good battle between them. And I think Perez really enjoyed it. And he said, you know, it just happened to be that I was the one that didn't uh, sort of win the battle. But he was Mm. like, I'm still quite happy with the battle anyway. Yeah, the the sort of being able to battle and put put the car where he needed to be able to put it, I think sort of re-sparked the confidence he needed, which was useful. And... Yeah, it was very much going to be one of those things that comes out 50-50. Either drive, one of them is going to win it. It's simply a case of when the battle starts in relation to the checkered flag and sods law as to who crosses the line first. But yeah, I think Alonso had a unique method for coming through some of the tight turns and veeing them off, which really gives him, he sort of compromises entry, but really comes away quite nicely on the exit. And it gives him a much faster run, especially coming out of that final turn, which is um, Young Sao, isn't it? And then on the run, basically along the sort of main sort of front straight, it gave him that big advantage. And that's where he was able to, at points, defend from Perez, even if he had DRS. It was really clever moves. And again, it was proper F1 to watch and really enjoy for a good few laps was those two going hammer and tongs at it. Uh, the non-finishers were, of course, Leclerc, who started the, or failed to start the race rather with a hydraulics issue, Magnussen and Albon with collision damage, Joe suffered from a cooked engine and Bottas a hydraulics leak, uh, though details on those two are a little sparse. I did troll through some Alfa Romeo press releases and they didn't really detail what had quite gone wrong there. Um, 
And then finally, there is George Russell, who boiled the oil in his Mercedes and retired. So um, an interesting one there for Mercedes suffering a bit of a reliability issue. Don't know whether it's the altitude, the cooling package, the fact that he spent a long time running behind Lewis Hamilton and wanted to try and make inroads into the race. But team orders were sort of stay behind, which was interesting. But they could have done it better the other way around, I think. Russell had a bit more outright pace and could have towed Lewis and then sort of formed a DRS train to protect them from sides behind. But in the end, they sort of left him in the hot air of Hamilton and he suffered. Yeah, I think as well, we've got to remember there's we only have two races left. Well, I I can't quite remember how many races there were meant to be on this calendar because obviously we got rid of it. We never had Imola or China. Mm. So that leaves how many rounds? Uh, it was supposed to be 23. We still had 23 races this year, I think, or something along those, something to that effect. Uh, but anyway, you, this was round twenty out of twenty-two. Sorry, twenty rounds. Obviously, you, you can't, you don't have just you know the one uh, mechanical parts for all those races. But it's getting to the point that they're probably very stressed and very worn now. That you probably are going to see come the end of these few races, reliability come more into play. So it's, I think it's kind of to be expected. Um, perhaps you won't see it in Las Vegas because it's going to be cold. Mm. But maybe in Abu Dhabi, it depends whether, you know, teams want to bring new engines or whatever to two more races. I don't think it seems... I think there'll be parts and engines out in Abu Dhabi because they'll have been sort of left over from, I'm going to assume, Qatar, or that would have been on that sort of freight line. Um but equally, you've got young driver tests to do afterwards. So teams are going to need at least one chassis and one engine for those, possibly a few extra bits and pieces on top of that. So, yeah, there is there is a certain extent of preserving costs and parts. But equally, as Mercedes, you've lost out on points this weekend to Ferrari. There's every yeah. chance that Ferrari might catch you in the standings. And... It's- there's what 20 points in between them. They were lucky that Leclerc got didn't None. start the race <laughs> because then it ended up only being Carlos with the points. Um it was a it was a strange weekend for Mercedes. They're because you you don't usually see them struggle that much with tire degradation. Maybe they were being over conservative with race setup because they didn't uh another um disqualification like they had in America it was very bizarre for a race where they're usually very successful at Mm. yeah it's just an odd one really but yeah I think Ferrari come out of this weekend despite having quite as catastrophic one as they did with 13 points where Mercedes come out with 11 which does like you say put them 20 points separated 382 over 362 that is a points haul that can be easily overturned in two races. All they've got to do is outscore Mercedes by 10 points at each race weekend and they've tied. And bear in mind, they've got a win to their name, Ferrari. So even if they tie on count back, they've won it. So, yeah, if I was Mercedes, I'd still be really pushing to try and get something there. And I don't think they pushed quite the right buttons this weekend. However, by race end, Verstappen was eight seconds up on Norris with the McLaren driver in P2 across the line and a scant 0.053 seconds, five hundredths of a second, separating the two cars of Alonso and Perez in P3 and P4. The two had shared, as we've already mentioned, an immense battle through the final laps with both getting the absolute most out of their cars. But in the end, with just enough of a good drive out of Jung Sao, Alonso held onto his position in a sprint to the line, akin to Gasly Hamilton in 2019. Verstappen has now taken the highest wins in a season percentage title from Ascari, a record held since 1952. He's also beaten his own record of most podiums in a season of 19, and now overtakes Alain Prost for career wins, now 52 total. Verstappen he's also... Only got the, sorry, he's only got the one more point now, and he'll be tied with Vettel. Yes, yeah, there is every chance that by season's end, he can overhaul Vettel's standings. Yeah, so he's probably going to tie with Vettel certainly if he wins in Vegas and Abu, Abu Dhabi is uh, past Vettel which is quite the impressive move Verstappen however as a constructor just Verstappen alone is now untouchable too Mercedes cannot close the gap to just Max so um, 
Might as well give Max the Constructors Trophy at this point as well, which is bonkers. Max Verstappen singing at the end of the Grand Prix was not on my bingo card for this year. No, and if it was, I don't think it would have been Tom Jones, Green Green Grass of Home. Certainly not one of Tom's biggest hits. No. I think I saw on social media that it goes back to his karting days with his dad and that that's what they used to play. Used to sing along to on like the van radio, yeah, when they were going off karting. So finally we get a happy memory of Jos Verstappen, which is (laughs) nice. Um, But anyway, yeah, it's impressive work from Max this weekend, rounding out yet another haul of sort of accolades and sort of records that he now holds or has broken his own ones to set again. Um, Six points, however, separate Alonso, Norris and Sainz in the battle for fourth in the Constructors. If Norris finishes where he is now, which is fifth, it'll be his first top five finish in a, in the cha- in a championship in the sport. Meanwhile, for Alonso, if he holds on to P4, it'll be his best championship result since 2013 with Ferrari. Sainz in sixth is looking to either tie with his best result or set a new PB of fourth, having never finished above fifth in a year. Sonoda also climbs from 16th to 14th, passing Bottas and Hulkenberg. So a pretty tidy weekend all round for some of the championship battles that are still raging on. This is also the first time we've ever seen a Lando and Fernando podium. Yes, yeah, because all of Fernando's came at the start of the year when, of course, the McLaren was nowhere. Then they very much sort of swapped. So, yeah, yeah, that is a very good point. Yeah, Verstappen and Alonso have shared the podium, including Brazil, eight times, whilst Lando and Verstappen have shared it six. But yeah, the first time they've ever been on the podium together. But interestingly, Alonso and Norris have also shared the podium for the first time with Max in 2021. By that, I mean Alonso and Verstappen, Norris and Verstappen. Um, Alonso was in Qatar. And that was the only time he'd ever shared a podium with Verstappen prior to this year. And then Norris shared a podium with Verstappen three times in 2021. So those were Imola, Monaco and Austria. Austria. And they also had a podium uh, together at Imola last year. But in as well, Alonso's podium in Brazil now means Alonso and Perez have been on the podium the same amount of times this season. They both have eight. However, Perez has two wins, four seconds and two thirds, whilst Alonso has three seconds and five thirds. But Norris only needs one more podium to equal them on eight. He currently has six seconds and one third. Mm. Isn't he also now chasing down Nick Heidfeld for most podiums without a win, I think? Possibly. I believe that is the statistic for Lando Norris of sort of greatly successful but so far without a win uh, i think it's nick heidfeld who currently has that that accolade of like most podiums without a, scoring a win so some interesting times in the rest of the standings and that's the thing like i checked back through my sort of um, positions tracker and again everyone goes oh this has been so dull there's been no sort of action in the field spain has been the only race weekend that hasn't resulted in a shift in the driver's standings every other weekend there's been one or more drivers moving up or down in the constructor in the driver's standings constructors have been a little more static but in the drivers every weekend there is a change in position for drivers there's always a battle happening somewhere which is really impressive and the fact that even off of the sprint alone sonoda sort of pulled clear of Bottas and hulkenberg and then really reinforce that point with the race. He's making for a really good run at the moment. And while I don't think he's going to um, catch anyone by season's end, checks. Al- Alban, is it? That's above uh, him? Where is my Sonoda line? I want to um, say he's got seven. Sonoda's on 13, and he's got to find another. Um, 14 points to tie with Albon. So it's a big ask, but. Yeah. Given the fact that Alpha Tauri really seems to have come alive in these final few races, it's not out of the question. Take off all of its wings for um, Las Vegas and send them out with a, a wish and a prayer, and they could do it. They, they don't do seven points, do they? So they'd have to have eight points and six points, which is what in the um eight points and six points would be would be would be would be a sixth and a seventh or you could get away with two sevenths and a fastest lap on each of them he has got fastest lap before very true he's done it before he did it in mexico didn't he yeah 
Uh, mm-hmm. Check Stokes. Yes, he did. Yes. Not Mexico, USA, Austin. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting weekend. But anyway, for, for all that, um, I do have to say Yuki Snowder is the, the winner of my well, winner of my winner accolade. Uh, we'll move into our winners and spinners section quite neatly from that point. And I've already sung his praises a fair amount. He's had a fairly good weekend. He's had some fantastic racing with some f- pretty top tier drivers and come out looking like a bit of a little hero. So um, Yuki Sonoda, this weekend for me, you are a winner. Ellie May, how about yours? I have gone for Fernando Alonso. I think it's probably obvious for, we've kind of been already singing his praises throughout this um, podcast. You know, he got Hamilton early on in the race and then just used all his years of experience to keep Perez behind for say, about 20 laps at least, I think. He was chasing him down for a long, long while. Yeah, and I think Alonso never defended air. He always maintained the same line instead, choosing to sort of strategically deploy extra energy in places where Perez could use DRS so that he was always about seven tenths ahead, meaning Perez would, would be too far behind to make that move. And he'd also, like we said, take that wider line around the final corner to get some sort of better traction and be able to put the throttle down quicker and when Perez did finally get Alonso on the penultimate lap, he then stayed so closely behind and he knew not to overtake at turn one um, as Perez could then get him back at turn four. So he chose to make his move there instead and it was just a drag race to the finish line and it was it was sensational driving. That his mind, for the oldest man on the grid, is so sharp. He already He already knew, I think, every scenario in his head. When you say like the oldest man on the grid for his mind to still be sharp, like at the age of what forty, we're expecting him to have like early onset dementia. But <laughs> I mean, it's he's still racing in top form. I think that is the thing to say. Like this is a sport that is physically demanding. It is as much as people go, oh, it's just sitting down and turning the wheel left and right. It is. It takes a lot out of you to do it, and the fact that like Qatar is the ideal point to sort of say that this is a man that is still in the form of his life for his sport. Like all the younger drivers were dead on the floor. And then you've got Max who did the Qatar Grand Prix with a hangover, I should add. And um, Alonso who's in his forties just sort of gets out of it and sort of looks at the carnage that sort of surrounds him and goes, "Hmm, fair enough. Like biblical really, and really impressive work from, Alonso sort of putting in the effort to get that far into a season and sort of still have that competency to still keep going. It's it's just remarkable and really enjoyable. I think as well, I just want to say my kind of on a side note as my also half winner as well, it's Daniel Ricciardo, mainly because he could have so easily been hit on the head with that tyre. I think I haven't quite seen where where he is in terms of the halo because some drivers helmets are sort of above the halo some fall under depending on your height Mm. and I don't think the halo would have completely maybe saved you if that tyre hit your head Mm. I think he was incredibly lucky and obviously he moved out the way himself and I think if he hadn't moved out the way that would have been his head yes yeah certainly without I think he was lucky that the tyre landed quite far back on the engine cowl. But I mean, we're talking distances of a few feet with something that's travelling at a good few sort of couple of tens of miles an hour at you. Like it's it's, it's still small margins. And yeah, Danny Ricardo is he's not the shortest driver on the grid. He's not the tallest either, but he certainly sort of sits with the, the top of his helmet above the halo. But equally, it's within that sort of triangle of protection between the roll hoop and the top front of the halo. So it's safe in a, when the, if the car were to turn turtle, but when you've got something heading at the hitting, heading towards the top of it, he's not truly within the car. Um, so yeah, it was remarkable in that regard. And I think very fortunate, I think oh, I almost play, say, play devil's advocate with this, but I think he's lucky that it was just the tire it wasn't like a wheel on a rim. So it lost a lot of its weight, but even then an empty tire moving at that speed would still hurt a hell of a lot if it hits you. Even if it just clips the top of your helmet, that's going to be a hell of a jolt to go through. So 
possibly something worth investigating, especially because we've seen a lot of tyres separating from rims in the past few crashes. This is something that's only really come in since we've had the wheel covers. It's on the wheel brows and the sort of covers on the front of them, the wheel trims. So it's something that might be worth looking into for 2024 is how we stop wheel rims cracking quite so violently that they just simply spit tyres out into the middle of the racing action because Hulkenberg ran over it and that's what jettisoned it so violently at Ricardo. There's something to be investigated. It was a unique situation. You know, how many times is a tyre going to then get caught on another tyre which then spins it into the air? But it's also perhaps one that we may need to think about if there yeah. are more collisions like that. What's to say one doesn't fly up in the air or even if it flies up in the air and goes over the over the catch, catch fence, yeah. thing and hits a fan yeah lands in the marshalling or the sort of stewards area or marshalling area if it lands in the fans area in the sort of stands there's a lot of things that need to be considered for the safety of it and we saw at goodwood festival speed early this year that one of the jaguar mark ones that was heading up the hill suffered a um hub failure and it jettisoned a wheel and half shaft into the crowds and they're protected by hay bales very different environment very different speeds but again the the consequences of that can be huge we even saw it in the indy 500 one of the crashes in the final phases of that this year jettisoned a wheel over the grandstands and into the car park yeah. the energy that we see involved in these incidences is tricky to visualize and conceptualize until you realize that it these crashes often have the energy to t if you go and pick up a standard car wheel and tire it is a heavy item pick up one that is wider still it's still a bulky item even if it's on a carbon fiber rim and try and throw it you're not getting it if you're an average built man you're not getting it much more than a couple of feet away from you now try and lob that over a nascar or indycar sized grandstand and then a good few rows into the car park the energy is enormous, and I think it's tricky to control that amount of power, but at the same time, it's probably worth researching the safety aspect of it because the last thing we want is a major incident happening. Yes, but moving on, who is your spinner? For me, it's got to be Mercedes. In a weekend where your customer teams, certainly in the sort of the realms of Aston Martin and McLaren with Norris, have looked so on form to have one driver retire for boiling his oil and another just tumbling backwards through the grid it's not a good look and equally we thought Aston Martin were down and dead but obviously not now they've figured out what went wrong with their car they seem to have just taken all the upgrades off and gone back to a very early spec car it's become quite quick again and all of a sudden with McLaren also being quite quick, it's going to be very easy for Mercedes to sort of become the third quickest Mercedes-powered car on a bad weekend, possibly fourth if Albon's doing something impressive with the Williams. It's that yeah, it's it's not a great time to be Mercedes. And they said last year, yeah, we're going to park the what the W12 in the car park in the in the foyer of the Mercedes headquarters. So we learn from it to not do that again. We're a year down the line, and they're at risk of losing second place in the constructors. They haven't had a win all season, even in a sprint. They've gotten lucky with a few poles. And this race weekend, Hamilton was getting sort of slapped around by Yuki Sonoda. It's not where you want to be. No. And maybe they get a bigger foyer? Yeah, they're just going to have to start sort of double stacking their cars, just sort of get some shelving and sort of put them all in, sort of go, oh, that one wasn't great. Oh, that one wasn't great. It's like appreciate that they're going into next year with a new design and new concept and they've learned what not to do but even then it's not a good look i appreciate I guess, that the things might be different next year but mm. i guess the only positive they can take away is they know it's not the engine yeah Such. for a large part yeah the engine seems to be pretty good and reliable but yeah mm. other teams are doing well mclaren and uh Aston Martin, I mean, both have fluctuated, but they hasn't been they haven't fluctuated because of the engine. Yeah, they've had the same sort of pace as always, but there it's been their cornering that's been the issue. Yeah. Mm. So they sort of need to build a car around 
that. Mm, see what happens. Anyway, your spinner. I don't really have one. I was going to say you've left it blank, which is yeah. Odd. I was think I was thinking about it a lot, really. And I guess apart from Mercedes, I don't. I don't know. I don't know whether I'm feeling nice or what. But I just I don't really think there was a spinner. I don't really want to go for something like Alfa Romeo with reliability issues because I think. Like I said earlier on, we're so far into the season that I almost, I don't want to excuse reliability issues, but. It seems harsh to blame a team for their bought parts failing on them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, they're bound to be worn. So maybe Machine Gun Kelly couldn't get Martin to do an air guitar or piano and left yep. the race early. I assume for other reasons. Yeah, he did seem monged out of his mind, to be fair. Yeah, maybe him. Yeah, we'll go for that one. He has sort of put out on Twitter or something saying that it was like, oh, it was so loud, I couldn't really hear what was going on. This guy comes along and thrusts the microphone in your face. Like, how many more times are we going to have this where you're on the grid, you must have at least seen or had someone tell you about it, that probably someone is going to come and interview you. You're a famous person. You must be used to people approaching you. I... At what point does it stop being a surprise? In fairness to him, I think it was a grid that was struggling to... Oh, it is so noisy in Brazil. Yeah, I think he generally couldn't quite hear Martin, but at Mm. the same time, when he could hear Martin, (laughs) the answers that he would give were were a little bit strange, because equally, if if you... Look at the interaction between Machine Gun Kelly and Martin Brundle. Martin couldn't really hear his responses either. So, yeah, it's it's an odd one in that regard. That I don't know, just it's one of those sort of failed grid walks. It could have been better. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a few other drivers certainly that are worth a mention for across the weekend. Science did all right, collecting points and helping keep the Ferrari Mercedes battle going. Um, despite the fact that he was very much battling clutch issues in the final third of the race, he lost downshifts, I think, on one of the paddles that so had to sort of change setups on the wheel through the latter part of the race just to try and keep running and somehow has sort of inched Ferrari a little bit closer to the Silver Arrow. So decent effort there from him. And then Gasly, who I've got down in my notes as decently mediocre, stayed out of trouble and was in the right place to capitalise on the fading Mercedes. It's not actively challenging from positions, which I would much rather see the Alpines doing on a week, regular, regular basis, is challenging positions and really going racing. But I appreciate, given how far off the pace Alpine is, especially engine-wise, it's a strong result from him, really. Um, finished a little way up the field. Obviously, Ocon got a point as well, so it's not bad for Alpine, but... To sort of be there with a conscientious enough race to make it count when it happens, it's decent in my book. Yeah, I think it was nice to see them have a decent race and Gasly has had a few of them now as well. Um, And as well, he was suffering for a couple of laps with downshifts as well. So I think he did did well to sort of negate those two. Mm. It's uh, very interesting. But... mm. All's well, ends well for Alpine. Move on from uh, reviewing the drivers to reviewing our predictions, which I sort of had a bit of a Charles Leclerc weekend, no points for me at all. Um, Two points for Timo, though, one for a Verstappen win and one for an Alonso top five finish. So well done to him. And then three points to you, Ellie Mae, Verstappen pole and win plus a Norris P2. Not a bad haul there. No, I can't remember. Oh, my wild prediction was Danny Rick in the points. Uh, race barrage predictions, yeah, might well have been. Scroll down, such a long way to scroll down. Uh, point on the bounce for DR3, yeah, and a Hamilton fastest lap with a Hamilton B3. So I don't think that was happening this weekend. I meanwhile had gone for a Russell pole, Norris win, Hamilton second, Leclerc third, Verstappen fastest lap, and Elbon top six finish, with none of which even came close to being true. Certainly not Hamilton second or Leclerc third even no not great but still it was another good weekend for you in our fantasy league however where um, highest scorer this week 381 points which means that you led Francisco Rhodes two and uh, uh, Alex H9V 
two, uh, no, Francisco Rhodes one and two were the uh, second and third highest scorers on 365 and 356 points respectively. So tidy little haul from you, and it does actually bump you up the overall standings. Um, I, meanwhile, my highest scoring team was 12th, Midbeds Racing, and on the curbs was 23rd. Overall, Alex H9V2 has now eclipsed the 6,000 points mark this season in P1. Francisco Rhodes is in P2 and Alex H9 is in P3. Midbeds Racing remains in P10, but EMT Racing moves up to 6th after a very strong outing. And On the Curbs is in 12th behind my second team, Jaffa Cake Racing. So, could be a strong finish from you here. Yeah, there's only, uh, I think, one point between me and whoever's in 5th. Well... So, we'll whoever they are. She's coming for you. I'm coming for you, yeah. One eye over your shoulder. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's a neat little point for us to wrap up this week's episode. We'll be back in due course to preview the Las Vegas Grand Prix. First time back there since the 80s. Whether it's good or not, we'll have to find out. But um, in the meantime, Ellie May, where can the people find you? You can find me on our Instagram page where I do the graphics or you can find me on the Undercut Podcast TikTok account. Where can the people find you, Jesse? I can be found on Instagram, Twitter and TikTok as at Jesse on Cars and you can find me writing for Classic Car Weekly and our latest issue will be out on Wednesday so hopefully the podcast will be out before then but um, go and pick it up and um yeah give it an enjoy i've been out uh, reporting on the london and brighton run so if you want to look at some very very old cars and uh, a short interview i did with ross braun it's worth picking up uh, i also bumped into david hill mentioned that and alan titchmarsh of all people plenty on that side and uh if not we'll see you again when we come to preview or preview what is that like that preview preview of las vegas grand prix <laughs>